let me introduce myself. I'm Mike Gurton. Um, they call me an editorial advisor at Fine Home Building. Um, so this is uh, session is site built under deck drainage system. Uh, this was actually an article I wrote in 2000. Well, I think I wrote it in 2009 or 10, but it appeared in 2011 in the magazine. Um, I've tried to do demonstrations at the JLC live shows. Some of you might be familiar with those shows. They, we have them in Providence, Rhode Island, usually in the spring. This year it's been delayed until August because of the virus. And then we do one in either late November, December in Portland. And uh, also at the Deck Expo, which this year will be in Baltimore. And I, last year I tried to do this uh, demonstration and I titled it, uh, site built under deck drainage systems for less than $1 a square foot. And um, there were several exhibitors that were under deck drainage system manufacturers. And uh, they told uh, my boss that if we didn't cancel the demonstration that uh, they'd be kind of very upset. So um, we'll see what, I don't think we're gonna have a problem with fine home building, but we'll see if uh, some, some sponsors or some underwriters, advertisers end up canceling after they see this. Uh, so let's see. There's a couple things I wanted to mention before we start. If you are into decks, um, do deck building either as a homeowner or as a professional. Uh, there's a new section that uh, Fine Home Building's putting together on their website. It'll actually be a series of project guides. Uh, the first one they've put together is on decks. And what it is, is uh, whatever the topic they'll eventually do, they'll probably have some on framing or finish work and things like that eventually but it's a um, amalgamation or a conglomeration of the articles. One of the problems with the fine home building website that I've experienced is actually getting to the articles that are there. And I know a lot of the articles that are there and I try to search for them in the search bar and I can never find them or very rarely, it's very difficult. So what they did was they found all as many of the good old deck articles and then we went through them, checked them for code compliance, made some editor's notes on them. And then if you uh, go to their uh, homepage and just scroll down a little bit, you'll see what, what you see here on your screen right now. It'll just say, find home buildings, project guides, decks. And then if you scroll down, there'll be a bunch of um, information, the different uh, links to different articles. And they have it broken up by design, uh, footings, and post and then framing and then decking and a few other categories. So it's a lot easier to navigate that way. So check that out. Also, um, if you like this session or the other ones that Fine Home Building and the Green Building Advisor have put together these little expert sessions with authors of articles um, that I did one last week doing this one and then we've got one next week. And this one I think is gonna be real popular. We're gonna see if we can hit a thousand plus people. Um, and I'm certain I'll be participating in it though. I know I won't be the draw. The draw is gonna be uh, Tim Euler. Um, for those of you who uh, follow at Awesome Framers on Instagram or follow uh, Tim on his YouTube channel or on his, I don't even know if he has Facebook, but anyway, um, Tim and I will be doing a session, I think along with Justin Fink, on advanced framing, the ins and the outs, uh, things I like and things I don't like and things Tim likes and things Tim doesn't like, as well as hitting some of the basics of that. And that'll be at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern on next Tuesday, three central, two mountain and one Pacific. So for Tim, it'll be early afternoon and for me, it'll be the end of my work day. Uh, so check that out. You can register for that at the Fine Home Building website. Um, so the, the, let me go through my uh, quick and dirty overview of where we're gonna, what I'll be describing in the system that I use. Now, there are a lot of different pre-manufactured under deck drainage systems. Some attach from the top of the deck. That's the way I do this one. Some attach from the bottom of the deck. Some go in between the floor joists. Several different ways of doing it. And when I first started doing the, the, the way I, I, I'll demonstrate here or show you here and walk through, uh, there were, it was only one or two under deck drainage systems and none of them were stocked locally to me. So I couldn't get hold of them um, easily. 
uh, between shipping costs and everything else were pretty expensive. So I resorted to making it up myself out of large sheets of rubber roofing, EPDM. Um, and that's what you see me rolling out here across this deck. Um, the process that I'll show you how to do is creating these uh, sloping troughs uh, between the joists that will drain the water towards a gutter. Now that gutter can be either at the outside edge of the deck, it could be at the center beam, or excuse me, the uh, carrying beam, maybe a foot or two in from the outside edge, or it could be back at the house. I'll show you some diagrams on that and how to lay out the EPDM so you create that slope so the water drains out. And then putting in a gutter. So the water would drain down the slope and then be dropped down into the gutter. I've modified the system that I use now from the original fine home building article. So we have a couple of resources that you can refer to. Um, one is the original article that I did in fine home building and that is called site built deck drainage. So this is not as far as I can tell one of the items that's in the um, the uh, project guide under decks that I showed you a few moments ago uh, hasn't been categorized, but it is an article that you can search for uh, with their uh, search um, bar. Uh, another article, and it's really just a short blog that I did for the 2016 fine home building house that I built um, back, what, four, four years ago now, four and a half years ago. Um, so there was a blog post and there's some pictures that uh, I'll be showing from that project. And then I did an article in uh, Professional Deck Builder Magazine. So if you're not familiar with that, the website for them is deckmagazine.com. And then you can just put in site build under deck drainage and you'll find that article. Um, so that way you can refer to things. Also, I want to point out that coming in the July issue of Fine Home Building, which should be out probably in, if you're a subscriber, it'll be in your uh, mailbox probably sometime in June. Uh, an article that's being written by uh, Asa Christiana, who is a former uh, editor at Fine Woodworking Magazine, and now he's a freelancer. And I've been uh, helping him look through all of the underdeck drainage systems that are on the market and kind of categorizing them into the different types and then giving some notes about, you know, installation. Well, actually, you know, I shouldn't start saying what Ace is gonna do because I'm not sure he probably changed his mind already after seeing that there were so many on the market. And this screenshot you see here was just all of the different under deck drainage systems that I've uh, sort of researched doing in my own, um, you know, kind of wrap my head around what's on the market. I won't be going over any of these um, during this session just because it would take too long. There are so many different varieties, but if you don't like the idea of trying to do it yourself after seeing the way um, my system works, um, you know, go and check those out. Uh, and since that article will be appearing in the July issue, that'll be timely. And for those of you who aren't subscribers, I'm going to guess that it will um, in some fashion appear on the website. So you can always get it a peek at it there. So first off, the different materials that you can use to make this system. Um, two ways of purchasing EPDM. One way to do it is in from a roll from a roofing uh, supplier. Um, and that's usually come on a roll. Uh, they'll be anywhere from 10 to 20 feet wide in the rolls and then you can buy them anywhere from 50 feet to 200 feet long. I tend to buy very large sheets. I'll get a 20 foot wide roll and I'll get a, you know, a 200 foot piece or maybe a 100 foot piece. And then I'll use that and store for a deck and then whatever is left over, I store for the next project. They always have a project I can use the rubber roof on either for a deck or for you know, a flat roof or something like that. Now the two different you com usual common thicknesses um, are 0.45, or I'm, oh, you know what? This should say 0 0.045 inch. It shouldn't say 0.45. That would be almost a half an inch thick. So it will be 0 0.045 or 0 0.060 inch. Um, and those would be the two common thicknesses. Uh, I started, many years ago using the 0.06 because I had some leftover material uh, for doing under deck drainage. Um, but now I'm, 
I'm tending to use mostly 0.045 inch. Now the other way to purchase it is by using EPDM pond liners. Um, these are for you know landscape ponds uh, for either fish or for plantings. And those come in smaller pieces. They usually come in either folded up in a bundle or uh, folded up uh, for the width wise so that the, it, it, they fold it so it's narrow, maybe only a foot and a half or two feet wide, but then they'll roll it up like you see here on the right. And those would be 0 0.020 inches, 0 0.045 inches and 0 0.060 inches. Um, I've never used a 0 0.020. That's kind of thin. Um, I would err on towards the uh, 0 0.045. Now, as far as the prices go, um, I just check with my roofing supplier to see what I could get. And if you buy it in large rolls, like a 20 foot wide roll by 100 feet long, right now I can buy that for about 53 cents or 54 cents a square foot, which is pretty cheap. It's actually cheaper now than it was when I bought some about maybe six years ago when I bought a roll, which at that time was running about, I want to say about uh 75 or 85 cents a square foot. When I just also recently checked the prices on the pond liners, those tend to run a bit more. Those tend to run in the uh, 75 cents a square foot. So if you have access to the roll roofing through a roofing supplier and you can buy a large enough quantity that you think you'll be using it, um, you might be able to get a better price point on that. Um, okay. Figuring out which way you're going to slope the membrane, because you're going to be draping this over the top of the floor joists of the deck after you get the deck frame. Um, and you've got to figure out where the gutter is going to be. So you're going to use a gutter, and I use, use conventional K-style gutter, usually a five inch, but you could also, if you think you have high volume of water, you could go with a bigger six inch uh, case style or any other type of style. You could even take a piece of PVC pipe uh, so like a schedule 20 pipe and just rip it in half and just use a half pipe um, as long as you, as you can suspend that. Um, so pick where you're going to have the pipe. I've got two illustrations here. One is illustrating a, uh, a deck that's framed with a cantilever on it where the beam is set back, say, two, three feet from the outside rim board. And in that case, um, you're going to put the gutter on the outside where the rim board's going to be. Um, I'll talk a little more later about uh, putting an extended height rim board that will actually conceal the gutter. Um, so that just a, a heads up on that. It's a way to conceal the gutter and actually give you some support for it. Um, the other way to do it is if you have a rim beam where you've doubled up or tripled up the rim beam and you use joist hangers to support the, the, um, the joists. So you can see from these illustrations that I've got a slope on the upper one there where it goes down and it doesn't go all the way to the bottom of the joist. The reason for that is because over the top of any carrying beams that you're going to have the joist cantilevering over, the code requires, and I'll give you the code section and explanation on this a little further into the program, but you have to put a, a block over the top of the beam between each of the joists. So you're gonna block in between all those joists. The height of that block doesn't have to be the full height of the joist, it has to be 60% of the height. So that's what I've done here in just illustratively. So because you have to be able to get a droop in that membrane and you're limited by the height of that block, you're not gonna be able to get that membrane really low all the way down to the bottom of the joist. So you won't get quite as much slope as you would if you were doing the lower illustration where we got a rim beam. Because now I can take advantage of the full height of the joist, be it a two by eight, a two by 10, or two by 12, you know, you're gonna have, you know, six inches of slope over the course of, you know, from the ledger board out to the, the rim beam uh, with a two by eight or like, Eight, eight inches or so slope with a two by uh, 10 or uh, 10 inches of slope with a two by 12. So you can get a lot more slope when you have a rim beam. So it might be a consideration when you're actually framing the deck or planning the design of the deck for framing purposes, how you're going to put that carrying beam in and where you're going to put it, the support beam at the outside of the deck, if you're going to figure in a drainage system. 
Another way to do this when you have a, uh, a, a carrying beam that's set back from the outside, so you get that cantilever on there, is to set the gutter alongside the, the beam itself. It's a good way to conceal the gutter because you can wrap around the beam with some, you know, box it in, especially if you're going to have living space down below the underside of the deck. And this way you can get the full slope, full depth of the deck joists from the ledger board down to where the gutter is. And then because the cantilever part is usually pretty short, you can still get a really good slope on the membrane and, and still clear the top of that block that you have between the joists. Um, you end up a little bit more work with cutting and, and piecing in membrane, but it might be worth the effort if that's the design of the deck. Now I've also not only installed these on new decks that I've built, I've also gone back on decks that were already built where the customers had us go in and take the old pressure treated boards off. Deck joists were still good underneath. And instead of just putting new deck boards on because they had some space underneath, like four or five feet that they used for storage, we figured we'd give them dry storage so we could put a membrane on there. Same thing you do is if you're gonna have some useful living space or outdoor living space but just having a nice dry space underneath. So we can also do it on retrofit that way. Now I see a couple of uh, questions that come in. I'm just gonna hit those now. So I have retirement home overseas. How does this deal with cold weather Northeast Burr? And is there something that can be retrofitted to existing decks without pulling off? Yep, I'll talk about that at the very end. Um, as far as retrofits, uh, I'll hit that at the end. There are some of the manufacturer systems that work for retrofits. Um, and I'll show you how to do this system retrofit. Uh, I don't have too many photographs. It's mostly by drawing. Uh, let's see. Do you have a cost comparison for over, under, and in between drainage systems? I don't have any cost comparisons for the manufactured systems. When uh, that article appears in Fine Home Building in the in the June issue, wait, is it June issue or July issue? I forget now. Losing my train of thought. Either the June or July issue, uh, Ace's article. He'll probably have costs on that, so you can look for those manufacturer systems. Um, the other way to do uh, the drain system where you can put the uh, gutter is on the inside edge against the house. So you can put the gutter along the house. You can fasten it to the house. You can run the membrane over the block. Because the membrane is going to be um, a fairly short distance between the rim board and the block over the carrying beam, you can still maintain a pretty darn good slope all the way, almost full joist depth back towards the house. So um, that's another good option. And then you can just box in around that gutter um, so that you don't look at it. Or if, you, if it's for storage space and you don't really care how it looks, you can just leave the gutter exposed. Okay, now let's talk about a little bit on those lateral uh, restraint for, the, for the, um, the blocking over the joist. This is a code section, and I'm not sure if it was in the 2015 code, but I know it's in the 2018 IRC. It's called deck joist lateral restraint, and it says joist ends and bearing location. So that would be the joist end being at the uh, ledger board or at a carrying beam if that you had a, um, the beam as a rim beam. Uh, then the joist hangers would serve that function. And bearing locations. So that would be the, the, a dropped beam that the joist is cantilevered over shall be provided with lateral restraint to prevent rotation. So you're going to prevent the joist from rotating. I won't get into the engineering on this, but it's when you have a, a, a framing member cantilevered over and you load the cantilevered end, the tendency is for that joist to twist. And because the code doesn't count the lateral restraint that the nails in from the butt end, of the joist through the rim board as enough lateral restraint, they require solid blocking. Some people think you gotta do full joist depth blocking, but the code doesn't say that. What it says is the depth shall be equal, not less than 60, or the, depth, the depth shall equal, not less than 60% of the joist height, which is about 5 eighths of the joist height, so it's not very much. So here's some for instance, in a two by eight, 
if you multiply that times 0 0.6, you come up with four and a quarter inches, leaving a clearance space of three inches over two by eight blocks or blocks that you'd need, the minimum block you'd need for a two by eight joist. Two by tens would be a two by six, five and a half inches. That would leave three and three quarters over the block. And then with two by twelves, when you rip a block down to three, six and three quarters, which would be 60% uh, of the height, then you end up with four and a half inches. So you can make that as part of your plan when you're planning the slope, when you're figuring out uh, the lines that I'll talk to you about when you're figuring, figuring out the uh, amount of droop that you'll have, the amount of uh, trough that you'll have over the top of the blocks, you'll figure out a, uh, a, a drop per linear foot when you do the math back to the uh, ledger board, and then you can carry that same uh, slope at the same, whether it's three sixteenths or an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch out to the rim board if you're going to go with the membrane running from the ledger board go back from the ledger board out over the, the beam block and then out to the gutter at the rim board. So that's where you got to do a little bit more math, but it's, it's workable. So creating these sloping channels so that the water flows, you're going to have to lay these sheet out with a line pattern that's going to be diverging lines from the ledger board where they'll be narrow out towards the, uh, the gutter if your gutter is going to be out at the rim board or it'd be the reverse if you're going to slope towards the house. So wherever the gutter side is, is going to be a wider spread between these diverging lines. So I used to do all the layout for these uh, membranes right on the EPDM. But then what I found was that usually, you know, if I'm building a deck that's, you know, 40 feet long and I'm only working with sheets that are 10 feet or 20 feet wide, then I end up having to re-snap all these lines each time. What I figured out is if I just take a piece of, and if I made a mistake when I laid out that EPDM, that was a problem too, because now I've cut the piece and I go put it on the deck and it doesn't fit just right. So rather than do that, I now make a pattern out of some six mil or four mil plastic. Um, I use black plastic only because it's easier to see the lines when I snap them on than the clear plastic, but you could use clear plastic as well. Now I use the four to six mainly because it's a lot easier to handle than a thinner plastic. If you get down to the two mil or the really thin stuff for like, you know, overspray for painting or something, those films don't behave uh, nicely when you're trying to position them on top of the deck just to test your, your uh, pattern out. So I, I, I cut a sheet the same width as the EPDM that I'm gonna be working with. So if I'm working with some 20, 10 foot wide and I'm gonna run those sheets in the, um, uh, the, from joist to joist to joist, 10 foot wide that way out from the house, out to the uh, rim board, then I'll use a piece of plastic that's 10 feet wide. Uh, and then I'm gonna cut the sheet the length of the deck from the ledger board out to the beam plus two extra feet. The reason you need those two extra feet is because we're going to make it, be making kind of a fan out of this sheet. And when you do that, you're going to lose some of the membrane at the outer edges because of the way you end up cutting a superimposing a straight line over a fan. Um, so that extra two feet gives you that. It also gives you some membrane that can wrap up onto the wall and tuck under your siding. Um, that way you've got it sort of counter flash by the siding, especially if you've either taken, removed the siding up high enough or if it's new construction. So I'll start out with a, a sheet. And in this case, let's just presume it's roughly 10 feet from one end to the other, one edge to the other. And then I'll mark a center line on that and then 12 inches in from one end and 12 inches in from the other, I'll just put a, I'll strike a chalk line. It could just be a dotted line like I see here so that the overall depth of the deck from the ledger out to the rim beam uh, is going to be uh, in between those two lines. So that's how you kind of get the, the sheet started. Let's see, just want to see if anybody's got questions. Nope, nobody has any questions yet. Then what you have to do is figure out what the droop is going to be. You're going to need to have a, 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 a little bit of slack in the membrane so that it falls between the joists. Now you're going to have a different dimension, a different droop up 
let's let's talk about this as if I'm going to do it where I've got the slope from the ledger board at the house and it's going to get lower to a gutter that's out at my rim beam. So at the house, as I'm showing here where I've got my ledger board attached, I want to have a little bit of a drop. You're not going to want that membrane tight up at the top because then you don't get any airspace underneath the underside of the decking. And we don't want to clog that up with any debris that we collect in there and having it, the membrane tight up against the bottom of the deck boards, the first one or two deck boards. So I'm going to have a droop right there. So I like to start out with about a one inch, but you could go with a little bit more. Um, so the way that I do that and calculate it or figure it out um, is I just take a scrap piece of uh, EPDM membrane, maybe a couple inches wide, or you could take a piece of string, or like I've done here, I've just taken a piece of, uh, it's a little piece of strap, nylon strap that I had. And then I uh, spread that across the joists, and then I mark either the edge of the joist, on the, in this case, I've marked the right-hand side of the, the joist here, and I would have done the same over there, marked the right-hand side off screen, you can't see it, or you mark the center. After you let it droop, so in this case, 16 inches on center joist, if you do this, what you'll find is to get a one inch droop in the middle, the length between those two lines that you mark is 16 and a quarter. In other words, you don't have to necessarily do this calculation every time you do a deck. You can make yourself a cheat sheet, like I'll show you in a moment, that you can use from one deck to the next to the next, as long as you're working with 16 on center. If you're working 12 on center, you'd have to make your own um, little uh, cheat sheet up, or if you're working with 24 on center, you'll have to make a cheat sheet up. Uh, so then at the opposite end, you can make, and in this case, uh, this deck, as you can see, has a rim beam there is no drop beam. So I can have the full joist depth all the way down. You can already see the gutters been installed there. And I'm just holding a piece of EPDM and I'm marking the left-hand side at the edge of the joist. And I'm marking the left-hand side on the opposite or the, or the mating joist, the next joist over. So those are essentially center to center distances. I'm letting the membrane droop down. So it's just a whisker above. I don't want it to flatten out there so that we don't have the so we don't have water just kind of stopping and not moving anymore. Uh, so it's just touching the edge of the gutter and that way I can measure that. Now, if I was going and measuring um, for uh, a deck where I did have a beam block for in the event that the, the, the um, joists were cantilever cantilevering over a beam, like in this upper illustration on the left-hand side, what I would do then is I would actually put that membrane over the top of the block until it drooped and just touched the block and then I'd lift it up a little bit and then I would make those marks and then I would measure that distance. That would give me the droop that I could have over at that point. And then when I do the layout on the, the, the uh, plastic sheet, I could actually do a dotted line, the two or the three feet in from the end of the deck where the beam block would be located. And I would do my layout when I lay out my fanning or diverging line. So you'll see those in a second. So when I did this 16 on center um, for the droop and what the length of the membrane would need to be between those centers of the joist, you can see I've got one inch is 16 and a quarter, two inches is 16 and three quarter, three inches is 17 and a half, and then it keeps going up from there. You'll notice that the difference for a one inch to a two inch droop is only a half inch. But when you get further down on the table, you actually need more membrane to go down into there to create a deeper droop. So when you get up around, uh, let's say uh, six inches um, to seven inches, you'll notice that the difference there is a full inch and a half. So in order to gain an additional one inch droop when you're at that six to seven range, you've got to let that membrane slake in an extra inch and a half, whereas to get a one inch droop was only a, a quarter of an inch. It's not a linear progression. I, I forget all my math, but it's, it's going to be, need to be a little bit more. So the ideal thing to do there is you would actually, if you're going to figure out a cheat sheet for 
uh, 24 on center. You can just take a couple of blocks, set them at 24 on center for whatever the joist depth you're going to use. Say it's a couple of two by 12s, take a string, let it droop in, and then you can make up your own sheet to, to figure out what you need. So I, I have this on a three by five card that sits on a file folder so I can refer to it. Then I'm back to my piece of plastic, those dotted lines that were set about a foot in from each end even though the scale is a little off on here, foot in from each end. And then uh, those chalk lines are going to be the depth of that deck. So let's say it's 12 feet from our ledger board out to our rim board where the gutter is going to be. And then I'm going to step off from a center line those uh, distances. So this is my ledger end over here. So I'm going to go 16 and a quarter, make a mark, 16 and a quarter, make another mark, another 16 and a quarter, make a mark, and so on, all the way up. On the opposite end, which will be my outside end, where I want to have the lines diverging, which will enable that membrane to droop a little bit further, I'm going to be going with a four-inch droop. And the reason I picked that is because this particular deck that I modeled up is going to have a block just back a little bit. So I know I can only droop about four inches in order to get over that block. So that distance is going to be 18 and a half. So I measure from my center line, 18 and a half, 18 and a half, 18 and a half, 18 and a half. And I just make little marks. Sometimes in order to maximize the use of your membrane, you're going to have to, instead of using one of the, using the center line as the line for one of the joist positions, you're going to actually end up being mid-bay. So in a, in, instead of measuring 18 and a half off, that line would be the center of one of your joist bays. So in that case, you'd go um, nine and a quarter inches on either side of that center line if we were going with an 18 and a half droop. And then it would be the same over at the opposite end. So you'd be straddling that center line. So just pay attention to what's going to maximize your um, material so you don't end up having a lot of extra at the outside edges that ends up being just cut off and wasted. Uh, and that's the nice thing about making this uh, pattern out of a piece of plastic. You can make a mistake on there and then go back and cut another piece of plastic because it's pretty inexpensive. So that's hey, what Mike, I'm doing here. Just a, where... just a second, Mike. Um, sure. Somebody was asking if those measurements would be the same uh, depending on the thickness of the EPDM. Does it really make any difference? Yeah, the thickness of the EPDM doesn't make any difference. Um, you, yeah, it really doesn't make a difference. There's a little bit more of an arc at the shoulder of the joist that you get with the thicker EPDM, but it really is negligible. Uh, it might raise up the bottom of the membrane by an eighth of an inch, but it's not going to be appreciable. So you could use all of those numbers. So once you establish the numbers, they'll be pretty consistent. Unless you got into the 0.09 inch, uh, EPDM. It's very thick. I don't recommend using it. Um, it's very expensive. Uh, it's not even commonly used for rubber roofs, but if you're sticking with the 0.045 or the 0.060, you'll be much better off. Um, please be sure to discuss how you manage the 12 inch extra in the area of a door threshold. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I, I hopefully I'll remember to touch on that um, when we get over to uh, the layout because it's going to depend on whether your deck is flush with the inside of the house or whether you do a step down uh, from the inside of the house to the top of the deck. So it might be a little bit different there. So here I'm just stepping off my my distances from my center mark. And you can see here how this center mark on this piece of of uh, plastic is what I found with this particular deck is that the, uh, to maximize my material, I had to run lines on either side of, and the center line ended up being in the center of a joist bay. So just an example how that plays out. And then you're going to snap chalk lines across those marks. And that, it, this would be an illustration of what it would look like if you if you sketched it all out. So you can see how from that center line there, ooh, it's making me dizzy to look at, from that center line there, those marks that I made, now disregard what you see me doing here where I'm making those marks at the edge of the membrane. We, this was a the article from Fine Home Building, and this is the way I used to do it. What I found is that 
you're better off to make your marks along that 12 inch in from either end of the uh, sheet. That way you're gonna get the accuracy where you want it rather than doing the uh, marks at the outer edges. So you're gonna have those snap chalk lines and then you're gonna lay the, uh, snap your lines between the marks um, that are along that one foot in and uh, from each edge line. Uh, so you can see here how the, the lines are diverging towards the outside end of the deck. This would be where the gutter is, the inside ed edge would be where the ledger is, those would be narrower, those would be at 16 and a quarter, the ones out here are going to be at that 18 and a half of the example that I gave you. And this is what the sheet actually looks like when you do what I just showed you, because this was a sheet I was making up for a deck which was 12 feet from the ledger board, which is the narrow side here, out to the uh, gutter side. And this was my 18 and a half here, and this was my 16 and a quarter there. So that's what it looked like on a piece of plastic when I snapped the lines uh, a couple weeks ago and just took a picture of it. It's, you got to do this on a flat surface, obviously. Um, I do it on a, you know, a sidewalk or a garage, or uh, if it's not windy, uh, do it out on a, um, a driveway. And then you take that plastic and I just take a hammer tacker and I just tack the sheet down. Now this is from a different deck. This was only about six or seven feet from the house out to the carrying beam. This was on the, the uh, pro home or the uh, fine home building house we did in 2016. So this is just a, a six mil plastic and uh, I just tacked it over the joists at that um, uh, right where the uh, chalk lines were. Um, and then you can see the one foot that's up on the, that would be tacked up against the wall. And what I'm doing here on the outside is I'm cutting and you can, it, it, it actually forms a scallop shape. So the gutter is already installed. I want the water to fall roughly into the middle of the gutter or maybe a little bit shy of the middle of the gutter, maybe about an inch or two in from the the face edge or the, the edge towards the membrane. And, but I want it also to be right at the point where the joist touch the carrying beam or the rim joist. So you're gonna actually cut a little bit of a curve down and then it's gonna curve up, curve down and curve up. And you just do that by eye. Um, cut it short the first time and then you get a second stab at it. The reason you have a one foot uh, extra at this end is because at the where I'm standing there and at the edge uh, at the bottom of your screen the as the one foot drops in the membrane is going to be kind of eked back towards the house at that spot and the one foot will only occur right there at the center of the membrane because when you make that fan you actually create a curve you can imagine the type of fan that people well, you know, the, the, the Chinese fans or the Japanese uh, folding fans that people will cool themselves with in the summer. As you arc that out, it cause, causes a curve at the outside edge. Well, the same thing happens when you're using this membrane and you're laying it down. You're actually causing a curve at the outside edge. Now, it won't affect the slope of the membrane very much, a little tiny bit, not too much, uh, that it'll uh, be important to account for that uh, in the layout. So ignore that. But the important thing is that that excess is going to get cut off. So here in the middle, you'll be cutting off almost a foot. But at the outside edges here, you're only going to be cutting off maybe like six inches or so, depending on how wide, whether you're working with a 10 foot wide sheet or a 20 foot wide sheet. Then over here at the house, the membrane, you can tack it up onto the wall or the plastic initially. And then if you want, you can just snap a chalk line along there and then trim it so that you've got a, at least an eight of inch uh, wall leg. Now you could leave all the material there or you could trim it. I trim it on my pattern so that I can maximize the amount of uh, material that I can get useful material I can get out of the EPDM rather than wasting it. Um, so that extra eight or uh, 12 inches that may be going up on the wall, if you cut it um, so you get eight, uh, eight inches up the, on the excess that was originally uh, 12 inches that you anticipated for. You may be able to, um, you know, uh, uh, minimize the waste with the EPDM. 
Uh, okay, so let's go to the next one. And this is where, now it might be hard to see in the screen. Down here at the bottom edge, you can see what I've done. I've taken, this is my roll of EPDM. This is, uh, I think this was a 10 foot roll. Yeah, it must be a 10 foot wide roll. And I've laid that sheet of plastic over the top and you can see there's kind of a scallop shape. And that is where the crowns of the joist are and the, the swale of the joist is where it's cut back a little bit more. So I've laid the, mem uh, the plastic on top of the membrane, and then i am just snapped a chalk line to get me a, uh, a, a straight line to cut off of the EPDM. And then I'm gonna go back after I've cut that off, and then I'm actually gonna trim into the scallop shape of the uh, outside edge. You can see how that's occurring right there, cutting off that excess. Then on the wall side, because I did snap a chalk line, the inside edge of that plastic actually forms a curve when I created that eight inch high rise that's gonna be going up, essentially being my flashing up onto the wall. And because of that, you can see here, I've cut off that piece of EPDM and you can see how it's only about an inch at the, uh, the left and the right side, but right there you can see I've cut off about six or seven inches right there. So that's because of that uh, fanning of the of the um, of the sheet that occurs when you uh, cut it, creating the troughs. Then you go back afterwards after you've got the the whole sheet trimmed off, and then snap chalk lines. On the center of the joist is going to be. Um, you don't have to do this when the sheet drapes in because the EPDM is fairly uh, eh, not stiff, but it's it, it's pretty uh, uh, it, it it forms a fairly uh, snap for with a chalk line, especially on the, the deeper sheets. You know, if you're doing a deck that's say 12 or 16 or 18 or 20 feet from the house out to the rim board, snapping the chalk line enables you in the midpoint to ooch it a little bit left or the right if you're not getting quite an even sag. And that way when you fast down, it's going to be uh, secured at the center line on each of the joists. Before you put the sheet on, you're going to make some splash guards. Now on the article I did in Fine Home Building, I did not install splash guards because this is something figured out later when you get a lot heavy, heavy rains. If you do this, what'll happen is the water will cascade, hit the uh, rim beam uh, or the rim joist. Uh, if it's you know, high flow water, then it actually the um, different underdeck drainage systems have sorts of. Remember when I um, back at this step here when I was trimming off the membrane, there can be some pretty good sized pieces that fall off, and you can actually plan it that way. So you end up with these uh, scallop invert inverted scallop shaped pieces that you can use to tack on along the outside edge, or you can just take some fall off after you've cut all your pieces of membrane to do the deck, and you have maybe a strip that's 18 inches or two feet wide left over from the roll, you can cut those pieces, which would be done here. I'm just gonna show a couple of pictures of this so you get the idea of what we're doing here. We're gonna tack it, and it doesn't have to go onto the top of your rim board or your uh, rim beam. It could just be on the side. It doesn't have to go all the way up uh, the side of the uh, um, rim joist. Uh, but what you do want to do is make sure that it's long enough. The bottom center of this splash guard is going to be about an inch or so, or maybe two inches in from the outer edge of the gutter. And that way you're ensured that when the water cascades against it, it will bounce off and go down into the gutter. So here's just another shot of us. Well, this is a loose piece draping down, but you can just see that uh, splash guard getting tacked in. And then here's what it looks like in actual operation. You can see the splash guard here and you don't have to have it scallop shaped. This was because we had a leftover piece. It could actually be a straight edge across there, um, but scallop shape works just as well. 
and you can see how the water is flowing out of the membrane that's between the joists. It's hitting that splash guard and then dropping right into the gutter. So it works pretty good that way. And then after all the splash guards are installed, then it's time to take our prepared pieces of EPDM and put them down over the deck following the center line. And then you can see how that scallop shape is leaving that space there between the splash guard and the, the EPDM. Now, I'm, it probably takes me longer to explain this than it actually does to install it because all of this goes in really quick. Um, as far as the fasteners to use, um, I've done it with hammer tacker staples. I've done it with uh, roofing nails. What I find works best is one of the um, cap staplers with, uh, most of those cap staples will come in the box. Uh, the staples that come in the box are gonna be electro-galvanized staples. Don't use those. I have a case of, uh, I think it's 3 8 inch crown uh, stainless steel staples with a, a, a one inch leg that I bought just for doing uh, my under deck drainage. If you're doing one deck, it's probably not worth getting the stainless steel staples. You could probably just use rails and staples um, and on the caps. I find that the caps are good because it pre prevents the, the, the crown of the staple from tearing through the membrane. And it won't happen ordinarily. The only time it'll happen is if one of us that are working putting the membrane on actually slips and puts our foot in the middle, which happens quite regularly. And that weight of somebody's foot going in will actually tug on the EPDM and it'll tear out the legs. But if you have a cap staple, it seems to distribute that load a little bit more over the one inch cap and we ha don't have as many uh, frequency of, of tear out there. Um, and that would be the same for the uh, splash guards. We'll use some cap staples with the stainless steel staples. An alternative to that and what I used to do and it's still viable, at least along the top of the membrane, if you're pretty sure you're not going to step on it, is you can buy regular hammer tacker staples that are stainless steel. They cost like eight times as much, but I have a couple of uh, half inch crown, or not half inch crown, I forget the width of the crown, but half inch leg uh, stainless steel staples. Ultimately, when you put the decking on, the fasteners that go and hold the deck boards down to the deck are going to be adequate to trap that membrane from ever moving. So even if you just use some stainless steel hammer tack or staples to hold the membrane in place over a long distance, uh, those will be uh, more than fine until you get the deck boards down. The only caution there being don't step on the membrane because it'll just droop right down and you'll go through between the joists. I won't get into OSHA requirements for this. Um, I'll let you figure all that out, but I'm sure OSHA wouldn't be appreciative of me doing this. Uh, a lot of times what we'll do, as you can see back here, as we're working the membrane, we put down some sheets of, of, uh, of um, uh, sheathing. We'll put those down behind us, and then we'll actually put it over the membrane until it comes time to, to put the decking on. So you can figure out a way that works for you. When it comes to your overlaps where the joist, uh, where the membrane will be meeting over the one you've just installed to the next one you're just about to install, it's gonna fall over a joist. I overlap it two inches in both directions. That's two inches past, as you can see in this close-up photograph on the, on the left side, two inches past the edge of the joist. And that'd be in both directions. And this is just a shot from underneath. You can see it sloping. This shot is taken from the ledger side out towards the, uh, the rim board side where the gutter is. Now up on the wall side, what to do? Let me answer that question on how you handle if you have a, um, a uh, door. Um, ideally, if you're in, uh, if you're in uh, the northern part of the country where you have snowfall, uh, or if you're in the mountain west where it's common to do a step down from inside the house down to the top of the deck like a six inch or so step, um, then you can just wrap that up and then you can integrate that with uh, whatever you have for your flashing coming out of the, the door. If you've got a level deck inside of the house to out on the deck, um, it's all going to depend on whether this is a retrofit application or if it's a new construction. If it's new construction, ideally what I would do is I'll have a membrane that I'm using as my door flashing. 
And in that case, or, or you might have a preformed uh, plastic or metal pan that you use. And in that case, you probably have at least a little bit of a drop and there you just bring the rubber membrane up and you bring your flashing over the top of that. Now, if you are using flashing tape for that installation of the door, make sure it is a butyl based flashing tape or a, um, a copolymer or an acrylic base. Do not use asphalt based flashing tapes in contact with the EPDM. The asphalt in those uh, flashing tapes does not play well with EPDM and you'll end up getting, uh, the, the, what'll happen is the EPDM will deteriorate in contact with the asphalt. So just don't do that. Uh, what I'm showing here is we've got them, now this is new construction so it was easy and this is a rain screen. Uh, space. So it was easy to run the, the membrane up on the wall. The thing that you want to be cognizant of though is that a lot of the siding is required to have an airspace above your finished decking material. Like say for instance uh, western red cedar, you have to have a two inch gap between the top of your deck boards and the bottom of your uh, red cedar clapboard or, or other type of siding. Um, if it's vinyl siding, you need three quarters of an inch. If it's hardy fiber cement, you need two inches space. So that space is going to be seen by people. And what you don't want is to be looking at a wrinkly piece of EPDM because there will be wrinkles going up on the wall because as you can see here, where it goes over the ledger board and this ledger board is actually spaced off the wall using the main deck bracket. So it's not tight up against the uh, furring strip there. It's back a little bit. And there, here you can see the uh, one inch um, droop between the, the joists. Well, you're gonna get some wrinkles because of the way that works out because that extra material, when it hits the ledger board, has to be kind of folded over on itself a little bit and then up onto the wall. So to prevent people from being seeing that wrinkly EPDM, I take a piece of uh, metal or plastic flashing and put it there. And it's mainly there just to cover that area where you can see. And then I also have a leg that goes out over the EPDM, mainly because as you'll see in the next step, I'm going to put a spacer above those joists just along the house to get my deck boards up and off the surface of the membrane so that we can get some water flowing over the ledger board. And this is on a retrofit, just to show you that this also works for retrofit. This was a house where I cut back the shingles and the shingles were cut back about an inch and a half or so above where the ledger board went in. So instead of doing a full uh, full detail flashing where I actually pulled a couple of courses up and integrated it with the WRB. What I did here is the membrane only goes up to the bottom side of the shingles and then I needed to lift the shingles off the wall a little bit with a flat bar so I could tuck the wall leg up. And that wall leg went up about uh, two or two and a half inches up above the, uh, the shingle course where I cut it off. Um, even though you might think, well, I, it, it's tucked up underneath and I wasn't worried about water getting in there uh, because of the way this house was uh, sided. So it's tucked up underneath. So essentially it's just a, a cover sheet, that, that flashing. Okay, so against the house, now we got a membrane going up, I got the flashing coming across and I'm gonna put deck boards on top of it. If I put a deck board right on top of there, what's gonna happen is it's gonna sandwich that flashing down. Uh, and you're not gonna get any water flowing underneath. So it kind of traps any debris along here that might fall between the deck board and the wall. And you're not gonna get any water flow under there. So rather than damming up the water and having a debris collection point, what I do is take some red cedar shingles and here I'm only using uh, like uh, shingles that I had left over. So it's only raising my uh, deck board up by a quarter of an inch because these were cut off for the bottoms of the shingles. So these are only about a foot long or, or maybe 10 inches long. Uh, a better way to do that would be to use a full butt of a shingle, which will be about three eighths of an inch and that'll get the deck board up. Now, some people don't like the idea of that where the deck board, the last two or three boards kick up an extra quarter or three eighths of an inch. They think it's a, going to be a, a noticeable. And yeah, if you put a level across it, you're going to see that you've got a, a little bit of a a curve there to the deck boards going up. 
Um, so, but I, I don't find that customers really notice that. And I, and I warn them ahead of time, but there's an alternative if you want to blend it in further. Instead of using those shingles at the end, what you can do is just make some taper rips of some pressure treated lumber. And that's what I did on this job. I just taper rip these four or five foot long pieces where I've got about a three eighths or a half of an inch space there and it tapers down to nothing. Now, uh, granted, there is a taper there. It's going to be different than if these joists continued another, you know, eight feet out to the rim board. But that slow slope isn't really going to be something that's going to be noticed. And it's going to enable me to have that space up here along my ledger board so that that last deck board, and you can see here, this is just a shot I took. This was from the uh, flashing uh webinar we did uh, last week where the, uh, just this flashing would essentially be what we what we're seeing here over the EPDM but we don't have the EPDM here but by using shingles or that taper strip you're getting a good three-eighths of an inch gap and that way water can flow down and out and then onto the EPDM so here it is with the the deck boards going in and up to the uh, membrane or excuse me up to the wall and here's a close-up shot now this happens to be boral, and boral does boral the trim. Uh, true exterior boral, true exterior does not require that it have a space off of the deck boards, and I just wanted to try it and see what would happen. So I actually butted the deck board to it. Um, if it was any other type of siding, you may not be able to do that. You have to check with the manufacturer to see that you can do this. But boral, I could. And here you see this taper strip, and I've left the. Uh, I did not bring that taper strip all the way up to and over the flashing because it's really not necessary. By the time I fasten the board down here and fasten, you can see the fastener, fastener, we face screwed it, went down there. Um, nobody's going to get their foot or any load on that cantilevering portion of the decking to cause the opposite side to lift up. So you don't really have to worry about that. It's not really a problem. Um, and that way, uh, we've got the deck board off the EPDM. Any water that might get down in this space here, because eventually this will probably move and there'll be a little bit of a gap, it'll just flow right through nice and freely. And any that gets through here between the deck board gets down into the membrane and then flows freely out to the gutter. And this is just installing the decking like usual. So some of the, um, the manufactured systems uh, for the deck board, uh, the under deck drainage systems will uh, create, they actually have these tapered strips of membrane that are wide enough to go between the joists. And you install them individually. And then over the joist where you get the two pieces joining, actually it would be over every joist, you run a strip of uh, sealing tape. Uh, I've never done that. Uh, I know a friend of mine, Jason Russell, who has his Instagram handle is uh, at, uh, at Dr. Dex. He does a very similar system. He uses palm liner and he cuts his pieces taper uh, shaped so that he can get the same kind of a, a swale that's a sloping swale. And then he overlaps his material over every joist. And then he puts a sealing tape over the top. When I say sealing tape, it's a self-adhered membrane, just like the uh, ice barrier membrane you put on a roof or some types of flashing tape. When you put the fastener through it, the adhesive on the backside kind of grabs around the shank of the fastener so that you don't get any, um, any uh, leaking through it. I've never done that. Uh, and I, I, I hate it when contractors say this, I've been doing it this way for 20 years and I've never had a problem because, you know, they just haven't gone back to check and see if they have a problem. Well, I've been going back on some of these decks. In fact, I went to one because uh, the third owner of a house that I actually did an under deck drainage system on about 15 years ago had called me up because they wanted to do some other work on the deck and the two previous owners had you know, there was some information I had given them that got passed from owner to owner. Anyway, call me back. So I got to see how that under deck drainage system was doing, at least from what I could see, and it was not leaking. The EPDM is the same material that we use for gaskets. And provided you don't, when you put a fastener in, like tear the membrane, you're not going to get a leak. I found that when the screws go in or the nails go in for the fasteners, whether that's a face nailed 
uh, pressure treated decking or face screw decking, or in the case like I'm doing here, using a hidden fastener system. When those fasteners go in and the deck board gets compressed on top of it, um, I haven't found that the EPDM leaks, or if it does, it's leaking such a small amount that it ends up being absorbed by the deck joist and then just dissipating by, um, uh, by drying rather than by dripping through. So if you are concerned about the idea of not having a self-sealing membrane over the top of your joist, by all means, put a flashing tape over the top, but just make sure if you're using EPDM that it's a butyl based or a copolymer or an acrylic based um, adhesive membrane. Don't use, as I mentioned before, don't use an asphalt base because then your deck drainage system will just fall apart eventually. Hey Mike, um, just a quick thing there, while you see the deck boards going over and this being closed up, a couple of people are asking about uh, how much you worry about debris getting underneath there, whether you put screens. I, oh, it's funny, they're not showing up to, on my, the chat, it must be just, you're just seeing it on your chat. Um, okay, uh, I will be talking about debris at the end. That's one of the things I will cover because I had the great opportunity to replace decking on a deck that I put the uh, membrane on that was 10 years ago. So just fin Addison and I just finished that up uh, last week. So I got shots of that. So I'll show you about debris and what happens. And we're in a pretty bad spot. There are a lot of trees around um, and we got a lot of, you know, well, you'll see. Okay, let me get back on. We already saw that shot. Okay, so gutters. Uh, any type of gutter you want. Uh, what I, one of the things to think about is how you're going to conceal the gutter. Uh, here you can see what we did because this was that uh, like six or seven foot wide deck that I showed you earlier from uh, the Pro Home 2016. We ran a taller than normal rim beam on the outside. We only needed two by six or two by eight floor joists. We went with, a, 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 in this case, it was a three and a half by 11 and seven eighths uh, rim. And that enabled me to fasten to it. Now imagine you're gonna do a, a two by eight frame deck with two by eight joists. You could put a two by 12 as your rim beam, a rim joist. And that way you've got uh, the, the um, uh, gutter can be attached to that drop uh, uh, beam or the drop rim so that you got a place there to, to attach it and to conceal it because you can box around it uh, with either some coil stock or just with some framing uh, and some you know trim boards right around it. Um, if you're uh, the other way to do it is if you're up against the house it's not going to be a problem because then you can just box around it and you just see a little box running along the house. If you're along a beam that's a drop beam, maybe two, three, four feet back from the outside rim joist. In that case, if say your beam is, uh, say a double two by, so it's three inches, the gutter is gonna be another like five inches, so you can just box it in as an eight inch drop beam, and that way you can seal it there. So you can just figure that out. There are a bunch of different ways of doing it. Um, here's just an example of another one where we were just setting up where this was gonna be two by eight framing, and these were just the isolation membrane pieces we were putting for the joist hangers. So this was a double two by 12 that we use for the carrying beam on the outside. So it works. And I'm getting the, oh, no, oh, this happened to me the other day. Rob, this is gonna take me a second. It's close, my uh, PowerPoint crashed. So I'm gonna close the program, cancel that, then I have to restart it. Is going to take me a moment. Oh, this has only happened to me twice. And let me get this back up. What a pain in the butt. Cancel. I was hoping this would be a. Nope, that's not the program. I got to go and dig for it. Open. Sorry about this, folks. This one of the problems when you're working with a computer that's about 15 years old. Well, actually, it's not quite that old, but 
I've overloaded the whole thing so much. Fine home building, fine home building summit under deck drainage. Hopefully this loads, slide show, view show. So I just got to share the screen to zoom back up. Share screen and it is this one. Bingo, okay. Now let me try this, 55, enter. Okay, here we go. Back to where I was, that wasn't too bad. 55 seconds, under a minute. Next shot, this is finishing off the bottom with a ceiling and how you can do that. Um, here you can see this was, uh, we ended up having to put some sleepers underneath because uh, we wanted to be able to incorporate a flat ceiling out to the rim beam so that the gutter was fully concealed. And we had enough headroom here so we could do that and still have about seven feet, six inches under that. But you can imagine doing a similar thing where rather than putting these extra two by fours that are hung underneath the two by floor joists, you could actually just run and box around the beam up on the inside edge of the gutter to box that in and then just put a clean finish on the underside of the joist. So you think you can extrapolate to figure out how you can finish that. This happened to be, you know, full beaded beadboard type of soffit that we put under there. Um, and you can finish with anything. Here on a house, which was a, you know, this is one of my rental houses. It's just an old ranch. And when I did this, I just put um, regular uh, vinyl soffit. And in this case, I used perforated vinyl soffit so that uh, in the event any water did leak through the membrane for some reason, uh, it would just dry naturally because of minimum, a little bit of airflow that permeates through the perforated ceiling. It just gave it a fairly clean look, but in keeping with the uh, value of the house and the look, um, we didn't go too crazy with it. So, you know, you can pick the finish that you want. Um, but you can pretty much finish it off. Another thing that's interesting to note too is that's rubber roofing. That's the same material you use on a flat roof. So essentially, you can put any electrical equipment down under here without having to use exterior uh, fixtures. When I say exterior, meaning I could, well, on, on this house, we put in some recessed lights. We didn't have to go with some outdoor rated fixtures because we're under a roof. Just like you might do on, say, a a porch, an open porch. You can use some uh, interior rated fixtures because it's 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 inside under cover. Even though water might get in down lower in the porch, it's not going to affect the um, the fixtures at all. And the same with the wiring. You can use regular uh, NM wire. You don't or NM cable. You don't have to use the exterior cable. So we just drill out the joist to run it under the joist and then put the ceiling below there. Okay. Getting to the debris side, this is what, when Addis and I pulled up the deck boards, this is what we saw was, well, and, and something to mention too is the reason we had to remove the decking on this deck, which was only uh, 10 or 11 years old, is because I was an early adopter of timber sill, which was a, a silicated treatment for decking, which was guaranteed with a warranty for 40 years, non-prorated. And well, that company went bankrupt about five years after I installed this deck and the deck boards actually rotted out. So <laughs> you could actually fall right through. So a lot of the, some of the debris you see here is actually the, not only the leaves that fell through, but it's actually the decking which rotted and actually crumbled underneath. So you can see here, yep, there's some stuff. I pulled some of the loose leaves out because some of the loose leaves had fallen in after we had pulled the decking off. But yep, there's some debris that collected. Um, there was less debris down along the gutter edge than there was up along the side along the house. Now this had never been, none of the decking had, had, had ever been removed. And that's about the amount of debris that you see there. Um, so it, there was some crud that, you know, decaying leaves. Now there are trees all around the perimeter of this house. And in fact, we have to rake this lawn about three times during the fall just because of the amount of leaves. Um, so, and, and my tenant is not meticulous about getting the leaves off the deck. So leaves would sit on there, fall between the deck boards, and that's where this decayed stuff. These were face screwed decking. So I could have, if I had wanted to, 
unscrew the deck boys, which is what we did. In fact, when Addison and I removed the decking on here, we unscrewed all of it. Um, so you could, I could have unscrewed a couple of boards and then just ran a pressure washer, even just a hose and hosed it out and probably clean most all of that debris out. Um, all we did was we let it rain one day or two days when we were doing the job and all of that washed out. Um, let me just show you. This was what it looked like at the end of the gutter. Um, you can see this is, I took this shot before cleaning the gutter. That's all that was in the gutter. And you can see right here, that's the uh, downspout. So you can see there was very little debris that collected in the gutter, uh, even after 10 years. So it worked pretty well. Now this was a high slope. There was about six inches of slope in 13 feet. Um, if this was a lower slope, if you were trying to get over the block in the beam, then there might not be quite as much uh, slope and not as much water flowing down. What I recommend doing to avoid uh, or to be able to clean out the gutters uh, or clean out the EPDM is no matter what type of hidden or fastener system you install, either face screw the last three deck boards or two deck boards along your gutter position or, or and at the house, at least three deck boards, you can face screw it or use a type of hidden fastener. And there's several of these on the market. I think uh, a couple, uh, um, some of the ebb ties work this way and the camo edge uh, hidden fastener. And there's a couple of like Coyote and a couple other odd uh, brands that drive the screw, not diagonally into the deck board, but straight down between the deck boards. You drive a very narrow shanked drill driver bit. And so they actually can be unscrewed and then you can lift those boards out. So you can get the advantage of a hidden fastener and be able to undo two or three boards, pop it out, wash out the membrane, and then put those deck boards back in using the same hidden fastener. The last boards, what you do is you set the hidden fastener as you're lowering the two boards, kind of like a drawbridge, and it will close down on the shank of the fastener, and then you just drive the fastener in. So you just have to play a little bit with it. Okay, retrofits. So several of the hidden fat, excuse me, several of the underdeck drainage systems that are commercially available uh, that you can read about in the, whatever it was, June or July issue of Fine Home Building that's coming up. I think it was July issue that uh, ACE is writing can be installed either between the joists or under the joists after the fact. Here's another way to do it if you want to do it using the system that I just showed you. What you do is you mount it underneath the joist. Now you're gonna lose some headroom when you do this. That's the same way with the uh, commercial systems as well. Um, the way to do it is you do the same layout as I showed you. You're gonna lay out uh, diverging lines to get a, a droop so that you're gonna slope that towards the uh, end where you're going to put the gutter. So you pick how that's gonna work, whether it's gonna be at a beam, that's a beam that's uh, inset or in from a cantilever or you're going to go all the way to the outside or you're going to bring it back towards the house. So you're going to take that membrane, you're going to have the line snapped on. It's going to take a couple people to do this. You're going to take a cap daler or a cap stapler and you're going to work from underneath and you're going to actually cap staple it so you get the center line on the joist is going to be centered to one of your chalk lines that you'll have on the membrane. And then you'll work your way out from a center point, or you could work from one end and work across. But in any case, you can figure out it's going to be awkward to do. What you might do is temporarily tack some boards up under the joist to support the membrane and then work your way towards the left and towards the right from the center of the membrane. Then after you get the membrane tacked up, it's going to have this swale coming down below the bottom of the joist. But if you want to put, well, you're going to need to support that, not just with the cap nail or staples. If it's for a utility space where you don't need a ceiling on it, then you can just take some rips of one by two pressure treated lumber, and then you can screw those up on the bottom of every joist between the membrane so that now you're or, or at the joist, uh, to the membrane, so you're trapping the membrane, so now you're getting full support. Or if you want a ceiling underneath, if you keep that droop in your membrane to about three inches, then what you can do is take some two by fours, and that's what I show here with this dotted line, just say some 
two by fours, and they don't have to be pressure treated actually, come to think of it, because you're under the roof. Uh, but you could do pressure treated either way, whatever you feel comfortable with. And then you're going to drive some long uh, screws, you know, like some headlocks or some uh, SDWS screws, something with a flat head on it. Uh, and you're going to screw that right up through the joist. So if I look at the membrane in cross section, what you'll be doing is those membrane will be just tacked up, draped below the joist. And then you can put either a small one by underneath and then nail or screw it up or take a two by four with some, say, four and a half inch or five inch long screws, drive those up right into the bottom of the joist. And now you've prepped it so that you can run a ceiling right underneath that two by. Again, you lose some headroom, but you gain the under deck drainage system. Um, otherwise, look into the systems that are available commercially. Now, I'm just going to check the chat box. And let's see if there were any other questions. So, Mike, uh, I can read a couple of them to you from okay. the Q&A section. Okay, came up. One person was asking about, uh, worry about lack of airflow if you're using composite decking. Mm -hmm. You're going to want to check with the manufacturers and see what their conditions are, uh, what their limitations are. I would say at least half of the... Uh, composite and cellular PVC deck boards permit you to use an under deck drainage system. Under deck drainage systems have become so commonplace. Those decking manufacturers have realized if they don't allow for us to install over an under deck drainage system, then they're going to shoot themselves in the foot. They're not going to be able to uh, actually sell their decking to people who want to use an under deck drainage system. Check with the manufacturers. Several of the manufacturers, well, I'd say at least three of the decking manufacturers actually have um, companion products which are under deck drainage system. Um, I believe Trex has their, oh, I forget the name now, there's different names, but Trex has one. Um, what's the other one? I want to say, I don't remember if Tamco with their Envision decking has it or not. But I know AZEC and uh, TimberTech, which are basically the same company, they have a system. Uh, so you can install it. Some of the manufacturers do have a gapping requirement for the deck boards. When you use an under deck drainage system, instead of having like an eighth or three sixteenths gap, they may want a quarter or a five sixteenths gap. But it goes deck board by deck board. Just look at the manufacturer's installation instructions and that'll be your best guide there. Okay, another Mike, question? Another question was, uh, what about concerns for oil-based finishes on top of wood decking damaging the EPDM? Yep, good point. Yep, you would. You don't want to use an oil-based finish on a wood deck unless, yeah, you don't want to. You want to use a water-based or use unfinished. Um, now, that said, I did put a, um, an oil-based finish on top of that deck that Addison and I just removed. And I know some went down there. And I think what happened was it, it, it was already damp underneath. So the, anything that dripped through got on the water so it didn't get in direct contact with the membrane because oil floats on water and then it got washed out since so there was no evidence of a problem. So I, I was concerned about that, but I wanted, I was willing to take the risk. So just be mindful that technically speaking, you shouldn't have an oil base dropping on the EPDM. But if you made the extra step of like hosing down underneath the deck so it was wet on the membrane and then put the, the um, finish on and then hose it down maybe the day later after that finish cured, you might be okay. But you never heard it from me. <laughs> One thing I think should point out about that, Mike, is that uh, some of these projects you do on your own personal rental properties, which exactly. are sort of your experimental uh, spaces. It is true. I have uh, six rental houses, and um, I, before I try doing anything on people's houses, I, I make my tenants uh, bear with me while I experiment. And, and yeah, so I, yeah, so you may not want to do it first time out with a customer um, for putting a finish down. How about another one? Okay, another question is, uh, how would you stand off uh, the gutter if you had wider six by six posts that were protruding from the outer beam? If, okay, so I'm guessing that would be where if you've 
put six by sixes and you put the beam in and you have that upright leg on the inside edge where you would put the gutter. So what would happen is you'd have the, the, the gutter would not be able to be close to the beam. It would be about uh, two inches or two and a half inches away because you'd be actually attaching the gutter to the posts. So there's an attachment issue because you want to have the gutter evenly supported. So what you might need to do is put a nail or a blocking between those six by sixes. So you've got backing for the gutter. As far as the membrane and how that would work is presuming that you can get a membrane coming in the reverse direction from your cantilever. Because if you're using six by six posts and you've notched them, chances are that is a beam that's set back from the outside of the deck. So in that case, you could extend the membrane from the cantilever portion a little bit further so it goes past that upright leg and that way it would move the water in. In fact, what you could do is actually run the main part of the membrane from the house so that it would fall into the middle of the gutter, run the other membrane coming from the cantilever portion two or three or four inches over the uh, primary membrane from the ledger side. That way that water would dump onto the, the main membrane and then flow backwards towards the gutter where you could put a uh, splash guard there and that way it would all be sort of contained. Now, I'm using my hands and trying to explain it. It's probably not completely uh, understandable but if uh, Rob if we, we ever want to do a little follow-up to the video we could do a couple little sketches and add them on that late, later on. Sure. Uh, one uh, one of our people was asking, what about laying plywood flat over joists and laying the membrane flat over that? Plywood deck would slope to outer edge, therefore the membrane will also slope. Yeah, so this gets to um, the way that I originally came up with the idea of using the rubber roof for between the joists. We used to, when we were doing decks or porches, um, we would put rubber roof over the uh, for a ceiling essentially above a deck and we would put plywood over it and then we would glue down a regular EPDM roof. In fact, there's an article that Rick Arnold and I did about, oh, it's got to be 22 or 24 years ago on doing EPDM. So you could do that and you could use any type of surface you want. In fact, what I would do instead, if you wanted to put uh, sheathing over the deck joists, with the intention of having a membrane going over this fully waterproof underneath. I would not use EPDM because if you use EPDM, then you're going to have to put sleepers down. Then you're going to put decking on top of that. It's a lot of extra work. What I would uh, actually recommend doing is one of the membrane deck roof materials like Duradeck and there's a couple of others. It's, it's like vinyl flooring <laughs> for a deck surface. So what you do is you put the plywood on you, or, or OSB, you put adhesive on, and then you put this membrane down. And it's most of them made out of PVC, so you could heat fuse them. So you use a, a super fancy heat gun. You fuse all the joints in it, and it's your finished deck surface. And it gives you 100% waterproof underneath. And the cool thing about it is you don't even need to frame the deck out of pressure treated lumber. Since that is a fully waterproof membrane, uh, you could frame it out of regular lumber. So by the amount of money you save for the pressure treated lumber would so may offset using a f the sheathing cost that you'd need to put up there to support that finished deck. And I don't think that Ace is going to put that as part of his article, but that might make a good article at some point as a, uh, a membrane decking. Another question? I think this might any? be the last one. Someone was wondering if you would consider putting a screen underneath the decking to keep debris out. A screen under the decking. So, you, yep, you could. I wouldn't do that. And the main reason I wouldn't do it is because what's going to happen is debris is going to collect between the deck boards on top of that screen. And then water is not going to flow through so well. And what will end up happening is that debris will collect and stuff's going to start growing in it. I found that homeowners are not really good at regular maintenance. and That becomes a bit of a maintenance issue. Given the, the experience after 10 years, what I would say is uh, tell the homeowner that once every 10 years, you should pull up a couple deck boards and just flood out with a hose and just treat it that way. Um, so that's one way to do it. 
So just in wrap up for the 80 so odd people that are still here, I think we got up to around 130 or 140. Um, that next uh, expert session will be next Tuesday at four Eastern, uh, one Pacific, and it'll be uh, Tim Euler and I and Justin Fink talking about pluses and minuses and the ins and outs of advanced framing. And you can sign up for that at the Fine Home Building website. Thank you for all joining us. And uh, if you think this was a good session and you'd like to see these occur uh, and have suggestions, uh, by all means, uh, email those to Fine Home Building. You can find their website link uh, to do their email link in there uh, at the finehomebuilding.com. Thanks again for uh, hosting us, Rob, and thank you all for joining.